want to welcome everyone and let me just say what an honor this is for me to be sitting here um, with uh, Dr. George Schwab. It's a great day because it's the first mm -hmm. Zoom meeting that we've done where I'm actually sitting next to someone I can touch. I don't have to look into the screen to be able to talk to him. And, um, and we're very pleased that uh, George is willing to share his um, memoirs, his thoughts on the book that he has just published, which is called Odyssey of a Child Survivor from Latvia through the camps to the United States. So we have it here. And if you're interested in buying it, it's easy to buy on, um, Amazon. on Amazon. I bought mine and it's easy to read. And there are lots of, especially for our, um, our friends from the National Committee, you may see yourself, there are all kinds of great pictures in here. So we're very pleased today that we can honor um, George and to have him to tell us a little bit about not only his life, the way we'll start out is we're going to start um, when George lived in Latvia, lived through the war and, you know, devote the first part of the program to that. But as in his memoir, um, we also, he has quite a section on the National Committee. So I'd really, um, many of you probably have lived what he's going to tell, but for me, it was very interesting to talk to him about um, his initial um, meetings with Hans Morgenthau and how the National Committee came to be and then how it evolved over the years. So just before we start, I'd like to tell everyone that we will take the last amount of the, um, of the program for question and answer. Um, there's a raise hand function. If you look under reactions at the bottom of your screen, you can raise your hand. But I think there, the crowd is small enough. If you just wave at me, we'll make sure that we get anyone who wants to ask a question uh, to George to be able to do that. I will say that um, this is uh, on the record in that we're going to record it. And there are several people who couldn't be here today but asked to be able to see the recording. So we will share that. So just a reminder, when you ask the question that you are um, being recorded and we probably will put it on our YouTube channel. So I think with that, I'd um, like to get started. I think everyone here probably knows each other, um, but you know, for those of you who may who don't know me, I'm Susan Elliott and I um, very, gleefully call myself the new George Schwab. What does that mean? Is that, you know, I have the position that George held for many years as the president of the National Committee on American Foreign Policy. And I'm very honored to try to follow in your footsteps, George, although um, I've still got a long way to go. But um, what I wanted to start with today is to have George talk a little bit about his early life in Latvia. And for those of you, if you haven't read the book, I mean, he talks about how, and George, I'll say this to you, you know, you had an idyllic life as a child in Latvia before the Soviet invasion and then before, you know, Hitler and World War II. But I wonder if you might tell us a little bit about, you know, what happened as a young boy and how things that happened affected your life, you know, given your, your young age. And give us a little sort of overview of, of that part of, your life. All right. Thank you very, very much. Um, yes, I was born in Latvia, in Libau, Germany, in Liepaja, in the Latvian, um, way back in 1931. It was an idyllic time for me. Um, it was heaven on earth, so far as I'm concerned. Um, I didn't like school but I liked studying English because that was the thing to do. It was, it was an in thing. My mother, for example, was still brought up with French. My father was Greek and Latin. Um, um, I loved the tennis in the summer, swimming in the Baltics in Liepaja and in Jurmala, that's the Jurmala Zeviga beach. Um, I didn't understand why we had to live in Liepaja and not in Riga. Riga was a lot of speed. You had a lot of trolley cars and bus lines, etc. You had only two trolley car lines in Liepaja and no bus lines. Many of the buildings in Riga had elevators. In Libau, there were just a number of buildings. Um, 
and I enjoyed the tennis courts. Um, I did not enjoy playing piano, which I was forced to do for five years. Um, and I didn't care very much for school. I went to Chuckstis Pamatskola, the uh, name of the school, of the primary school. Um, and then uh, things started to get a little bit rough. Uh, in the late um, 1930s, there was a lot of war talk, uh, but everyone believed that Latvia and the other Baltic states would not be affected um, because we were between the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany, and neither would want to go to war against um, each other because of the uh, tragedies of World War I, how both sides suffered immensely, so we felt very secure that nothing would happen. Then, of course, came August 1938, um, where Molotov and Ribbentrop signed the Non-Aggression Pact, um, which made us feel very safe. Uh, in other words, we would continue to live, quote unquote, in paradise, because for us it was basically paradise here by uh, in uh, Latvia in general, um, only uh, to find out that a little later um, uh, it was violated and suddenly we found Soviet uh, troops entering Latvia, not as yet occupying, but being present. And this was at the end of August, 1939. And a few weeks before the non-aggression pact was signed between Molotov and Ribbentrop, um, and then, of course, uh, came the uh, Soviet occupation of uh, Latvia in June 1940. And that really begins the true rough period. Um, uh, we had to leave our apartment. My father's practice was curtailed. Uh, and he was a gastroenterologist, uh, Berlin trained gastroenterologist in Dorpat. Um, as well as uh, he was the first one uh, in Latvia to have introduced the treatment of insulin for patients uh, way back in the 1920s. And nobody believed that anything would come to harm the Jewish population, especially those, you know, with his profession, so on and so forth. So, um, a turning point in the Russian period came one week before the outbreak of World War II in the East, um, when there were mass deportations uh, to the Soviet Union. Um, one week before the war, it was the 14th of June, 1939. Um, and that's when I, again, we began to feel very uneasy and also a spread of anti-Semitism because of the Nazi propaganda. Uh, that was uh, widespread even in the Soviet period. And of, you were how old then? About I was about nine, nine. Nine. So you were quite young. Yes, I was quite young. I was nine. But I also heard Judeo-Bolshevism, Judeo-Bolshevism. This was Nazi propaganda. And then uh, the seeped into the <coughs> Latvian culture to an extent, um, not yet too much, but after the 14th of June, it really became more prominent. But one week later, the war broke out when the Nazis invaded the Soviet Union. And that, of course, hell broke loose um, for us Jews in particular. Um, uh, and in many ways, uh, in the future, uh, 1942, 43, we looked toward the Soviets that we used to hate in 1940-41 early as being our liberators, strange as it may seem, because in comparison to the Nazis, um, the Soviets were uh, mild uh, so far as the Jews were concerned. Uh, a good number of Latvians uh, looked at the Nazis as liberators, which I can understand, uh, but we Jews did not look at the Nazis as liberators. They were our killers. So, yeah, in fact, they were probably worse for Jews than, oh, than the Soviets. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. No, no comparison at all. So, so much so that in 42, 43, 44, we were looking forward to be liberated by the Russians. Mm -hmm. 
well, our former enemies. You could tell the audience a little bit about what happened to your father. Um, your father was well respected, and to me, what happened to him uh, yes. seems unbelievable. Yeah. But. Well, my father always said, you know, uh, Deutsche Kultur, German culture, nothing is going to happen to us. My father was a Berlin trained gastroenterologist gastroenterologist, Dorfbord and Berlin trained gastroenterologist. And as I said before, he was the first one uh, who introduced uh, insulin in the treatment of um, diabetes in Latvia. He thought that nothing would happen to us, that we were safe. And the German people are highly cultivated, highly uh, civilized people, and they're not going to kill or do anything of the sort, but propaganda was uh, propagated. Yeah. And then, of course, one uh, about a couple of weeks after the German occupation, he was arrested. He was terribly beaten. He, uh, and, I, and I was knocked out. He begged to be shot. Um, the pain was absolutely incredible. A Latvian came to tell us what had happened to him, a former Latvian patient. Uh, and then we heard also from others. And he uh, was killed at the end of July, 1941. So who remained of the family? My mother, my older brother, and I. Subsequently, we were uh, put into a ghetto in Liepaja, then in Measure Park in Riga, was a concentration camp. And from there, we were transported to Germany to the extermination camp Stutthof near Danzig. Yeah. But before the deportation to Danzig, I lost my brother. He was killed in Riga, still in Rumbula, Riga. So, and I was separated from my mother. So starting at about uh, July 1944, I was pretty much alone in Germany in the concentration camp and in two work camps, and then back to the concentration camp Stutthof. Uh, of course, there were gas chambers, so on and so forth. How I survived, I really don't know. It was nothing but luck. Uh, I was all by myself. There was an older person who looked a little bit after me, but couldn't do very much. Uh, nevertheless, he helped me. Uh, and of course, we were all starved. Uh, Eventually, we were deported on barges to Germany, um, to Neustadt-Holstein, which was not far from Lübeck. Um, and there I, I was liberated um, on the 3rd of May, five days before the end of World War II. Um, and then I was hospitalized with general bodily weaknesses twice. Um, and I, became a street boy. Uh, my, I didn't know where my mother was, whether she was alive or not. I was all alone. I was basically, I grew up for the next year. I was nothing but a street boy, uh, making a living, playing cards, uh, getting some cigarettes from uh, the British soldiers, uh, which I was able to. So you were an entrepreneur from a very young age. I had no choice, yeah. yes. I was a street boy. Um, making a living on the black market, mm -hmm. uh, et cetera. And, and how did you find your mother? I mean, how that- Yes, uh, before it all happened, uh, really in the German period, I was reminded that I had relatives in London and relatives in the United States. I must remember that one of my uncles was one of the directors of Shell Oil. And uh, other cousins I had in the United States, uh, but I had forgotten. And of course, I was still pretty much illiterate. Uh, I wrote letters addressed to Robert Schwab, uh, London, England. Of course, it never arrived. It went through military mail. Uh, and then uh, I mistakenly wrote to David Alder, director Shell Oil Salt Lake City, where a cousin of mine was living, but there was no director of Shell Oil in Salt Lake City. It was just a station, a Shell station. After receiving several illiterate letters, he looked up who Alder was, uh, and he owned an insurance company. And he called uh, Mr. Alder and asked whether he knew um, of person by the name of George Schwab. And this alder said, yes, it's a cousin of my wife. So on the one hand, this is how I connected and my mother. 
mm -hmm. was liberated and I didn't know very much about uh, where or how or she, whether she was alive. She wrote to London and of course it reached uh, my uncle Robert Schwab. So this was how we connected. So you connected um, via London and, and the US. So, yes, and, 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 and the that US, got that's you right. Uh, that got us, us together and I was for, for several months uh, in a kind of a DP camp for children at the Warburg Estate in Hamburg. Uh, and from there I was brought to Berlin where I actually met my mother uh, in 19, for May 1946. And then... Um, so how long were you actually separated then? For uh, three years? 40, uh, 43 to 46, three years, wow. yes, wow. separated. And then in, 40, uh, in uh, February 47, we came to the United States uh, at last. So I started going school, went to school over here. I got my uh, high school degree in 1949. I got uh, my uh, MA degree uh, in 1954 and eventually my PhD in 1968. I began my teaching career at Columbia and uh, then I got a much better deal at the City University than at Columbia. So I went to City College and eventually to the Graduate Center and City College. Uh, well, maybe you want to tell us a little bit about, because this was a little unbelievable to me. Tell us about your membership in the Stern gang. Oh, I don't picture, at least for me, um, I don't picture George Schwab as a member of a gang. But uh, tell us a little bit about how you got involved with that. This was in Berlin uh, in, um, and subsequently actually in Brooklyn, New York. Um, which uh, at the New Utrecht High School, uh, I don't know how I got into high school after the years, you know, I was semi-literate, but I did, and I graduated in two years, was heavily Zionist oriented of all sorts of shades, general Zionists, the Irgun, uh, which was an underground movement and much more radical. Having been liberated and went through the war years, nothing, uh, no moderation was on my agenda. I became an extremist, wanted to shoot my way into Palestine, etc. And the Stern gang, they assassinated Count Volker Bernadotte, uh, Lord Moyne, uh, among others. And this was uh, my cup of tea. Uh, mm -hmm. I didn't believe in negotiations. I didn't know anything about this. I mean, to me, so it's force, this is what I've been accustomed to for a number of years. And we were smuggling arms and ammunition to Palestine to fight the British. Uh, and we were being trained for assassination tactics. Um, and we're going to assassinate uh, some people here in the United States actually. Uh, uh, and uh, and how did you sort of get away from that? Yes. Or maybe you're still a member and we don't know <laughs> clandestinely. No, what happened was that the state of Israel, uh, Palestine became the state of Israel. And <clears throat> on the Stern Grang, I had to swear allegiance on the Hebrew Bible, a Mauser, which mm -hmm. was a German uh, handgun, that we would never give up on the two sides of the Jordan because this was Palestine originally, two sides of the Jordan, uh, which was separated uh, by the British mandate in 1921 for administrative reason that became Transjordan and the Western part was Palestine. We were never permitted to give up the two sides of the Jordan. Now, when, Palestine, when Israel became a state, the leadership agreed that we were separate now from Transjordan and Palestine is on the West Bank. Mm -hmm. This was unacceptable to the Stern Gang, and the Stern Gang said, no, we don't accept this. And the Jewish leaders, the Israeli leaders, who favored the separation ought to be assassinated, their enemies. And so I they were going to assassinate Jewish leaders then? Yes, the Ben-Gurion yeah. and uh, Sharet, Shertok, Sharet, mm -hmm. yes. And I said, uh, even though I took uh, the oath on two sides of the Jordan, after losing so many people, 
I cannot shoot a fellow Jew and I quit. I was brought up on trial in Brooklyn oh, really? Park, yes. Um, and my life was threatened if I would divulge the things that we did in our cells. Um, uh, actually, I was almost assigned to monitor Sir Gladwin Jeb, who was one of the British uh, delegates to the UN because of his attitude. Um, but, and I, among other cellmates who were going to assassinate uh, Sir Gladwin Jeb, um, but this never came to pass. I quit uh, because of it. And I was excommunicated, so to speak, mm -hmm. from the group. And if I were ever to approach, approach any of my cellmates, et cetera, et cetera, my end was inevitable. Well, I'm, inevitable. for one, I'm very glad that you didn't um, carry through on any of those assassinations <laughs> because we wouldn't be having this discussion today and probably we may not have had the National <laughs> Committee. Yeah. But since many of our, you know, I want to be able to save time for questions, you know, many of our viewers are members of the committee. Maybe we could fast forward to 1974 and you could tell us a little bit about how you met Hans Morgenthau and how the National Committee was formed. All right. Um, I was um, teaching at that time at uh, City College and the Graduate Center. Uh, Hans Morgenthau retired from the University of Chicago in the early, early 1970s and was brought to City College. It was John Hertz, another uh, good friend of mine, a professor who uh, convinced uh, Hans Morgan thought to come to City College in the Graduate Center. Uh, and that's where I first met uh, Hans Morgan, so by way of John Hertz. Um, and uh, he said to me, uh, George, I read your book uh, on Carl Schmidt. Um, I agree and I disagree on things. And we met a number of times uh, for lunch at the mm -hmm. Graduate Center and at City College. And at one point he said to me, you know, George, I was approached about founding, organizing some sort of a think tank, an activist think tank. Uh, I said, I've, uh, at the Graduate Center, we had lunch. Uh, and I said, uh, yes, I've heard something too, but your name was not mentioned. And I remember this very distinctly. And we dropped it. Mm -hmm. um, at the subsequent lunch, he brought up this matter. Uh, we continued to talk about Schmidt. Um, he was very much interested in you, Schmidt, and to an extent was influenced by Schmidt. And Schmidt was also influenced somewhat by Morgenthau. Uh, so he said, uh, he asked me if I would be interested in becoming part of such an activist foreign mm -hmm. policy organization. How could I say no to Hans Morgan? So no, yeah. absolutely not. So I said, yes. Um, and suddenly I received an invitation to appear at the home here in Manhattan of Ambassador Ira Hirschman. I unfortunately could not attend because I had an evening class to teach and mm -hmm. I didn't want to miss, you know, I was new at this mm -hmm. pretty much. So, uh, I didn't want to miss a class, so I uh, could not attend, but was informed that I'm a co-founder of the committee and the member, of course, of its board of directors. And that is uh, that was basically the birth mm -hmm. at the home of Ambassador Ira Hirschman uh, that evening. And I was informed a day or two later that I am one of the co-founders of the board a dozen people or even less. Yeah, well, and you know, given that Hans Morgenthau then died six years later, I mean, really you were the co-founder, but you were and have been the sustainer of the, the National Committee. And maybe we'll fast forward a little bit because there's several good stories in the book that I encourage people you know, to read. But tell us a little bit about how you met uh, Bill Flynn and how your you know, connection to him changed the nature of the organization. All right, um, uh, I became a good friend of the late Elie Wiesel, mm -hmm. and uh, he was also a member of the board. And then Elie Wiesel received the Nobel Peace Prize, and with the money, he established the Elie Wiesel Foundation. And the first director was a nun, namely Sister Carol Rittner was the uh, first uh, director. 
And then Elie Wiesel, together with Francois Mitterrand, president of France, decided to co-host a uh, gathering at the Elysee Palace in Paris of 70 Nobel laureates. Mm -hmm. 70 were invited and 70 came, including wow. Henry Kissinger. I remember meeting for the first time. That was the first time you met yes, Kissinger. Henry Kissinger, mm -hmm. yes, way back. Um, and, um, uh, but before then, Sister Carol was the first director of the Elie Wiesel Foundation. And when this whole thing came about, and th that's when I met um, Bill Flynn, um, Sister, Carol, Sister Carol, Carol, and we became good friends. We also was my late wife, and she stayed here whenever she was in Manhattan because she was all alone when she was with the Elie Wiesel Foundation. And when this came about in 1988, uh, that Mitterrand and uh, decided to co-host it in Paris at the Elysee Palace. Sister Carol asked me to accompany her in order to arrange, to help her arrange the setting, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And Ellie asked me to be his advisor on disarmament issues. Mm -hmm. So I went twice to Paris, the first time to help Sister Carol. I came back and then I went again at the time with Ellie and Mitterrand had suggested that before the conference start, he would put a plane at our disposal. We should go to Auschwitz-Birkenau to visit mm -hmm. the, his extermination camps. So we all, the day before opening of the conference, we all flew to Auschwitz-Birkenau where we were received by Lech Valenza uh, at that time. Uh, and uh, it was quite an experience. Uh, I still remember this very well to be at an extermination camp reminded me of Stutthof, which mm -hmm. was an extermination camp. And I was anxious to get back to Paris. Um, and the contrast between Auschwitz, uh, Birkenau, and the grandeur of uh, the Elysee Palace mm -hmm. was something incredible. And I, I just felt uncomfortable. Yeah, I can imagine. Uh, I felt uncomfortable. Nevertheless, um, it was also at, at Paris uh, during the conference that I met Bill Flynn. How come that he was there? He was a friend of Sister Carol. Um, and Bill Flynn underwrote a part of, of the, the conference. conference. Mm -hmm. So it was really Bill Flynn Mutual of America. As I understand it, Part of it was the Elie Wiesel Foundation, and a great part was not even a great part, I don't know, you see, and a part was the Elie's, uh, Francois Mitterrand. Mm -hmm. But you hadn't met Bill before, before. then, and no. he wasn't involved with the National Committee. No, then. no, no, yeah. no. So Sister Carol introduced me to Bill Flynn, and Bill Flynn was very intrigued by the National Committee. He asked what I was doing, et cetera, I explained, et cetera. It's an activist foreign policy organization, so on and so forth. He said he would like to visit it sometimes. I said, you know, we have meetings uh, in New York, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, in due time, he did come around to meetings at the National Committee uh, uh, and uh, we were facing financial difficulties at the National Committee. Yeah. This was the turning point. This is your one of your most important decisions of your life, in my opinion. But anyway, finish the story. Yeah. It's a great story. Um, and so, um, and Sister Carol was also involved with that. Maybe she was on our board, etc. And Sister Carol liked very much what was going on at the National Committee. Bill Flynn came around uh, and I said to Carol, but you know, we're facing financial problems. She said, let me talk to Philip, Flynn, et cetera, et cetera. So one day we get an invitation from Flynn, my late wife, I, sister Carol, and two executives, Linda de Hoog, uh, and another executive from Mutual of America. And he took us in the West 40s, 19th, uh, in the West 40s in Manhattan, to a wonderful, wonderful restaurant, which also had a dance floor, was I think Peter Duchin or one wow. of the Duchins who was playing, we were dancing, Flynn was dancing with uh, my late wife, Eleonora, with Sister Carol, etc., and none. And um, uh, 
And I, according to uh, Sister Carol, was supposed to ask him to tell him that we are different with these, et cetera, et cetera. And I was not used to asking for money. So it was strange. So while he was dancing, let's say, with my uh, wife, for, uh, kick me out <laughs> under the table, <laughs> ask already. I said, Carol, I can't, so to watch her. No, well, I can't. Uh, let me sit down. Uh, she would, again, you know, kick me under the table, ask already. I said, Carol, I can't do it. I'm not used to it. Come on. So I finally, <laughs> I finally said, you know, but Bill, we do, Mr. Flynn, uh, we do have some financial difficulties uh, at the National Committee. Yeah? Uh, he looked at me and said, uh, well, what do you mean? How much is involved? Uh, I said ten thousand dollars would help us greatly, but twenty thousand uh, dollars would bring us into heaven. So he looked at me, he smiled, and said, "You will have a check in the letter amount tomorrow morning." Fantastic. This was all kicking under the <laughs> <laughs> under the, ta <laughs> under the table. Uh, yeah, that was Bill. We Flair. need to meet Sister Carol. Yes, um, but she was very much involved. I'm having dinner with her on uh, Monday evening. She's coming in with Sister Deidre. She's coming in and meeting them. Um, and uh, Grace also wants to meet her. Mm -hmm. she, George, I mean, please, I would love to meet Sister Carol. Uh, so I have to call Sister Carol. And then Carol. how did you get involved with um, the Northern Ireland peace oh, process? Yes. Was that via... Uh, Yes, Bill? yes, Bill, you know, he gave us this money, etc. And uh, I persuaded that he should become chairman of the National Committee, which he agreed, uh, no problem. And then he said, you know, George, we should do something with Northern Ireland to bring peace uh, to the two peoples, they're butchering each other, etc, etc. And, you know, I thought to myself, we're not we're a foreign policy association. How on earth can we justify getting involved in domestic politics? And I had a student, a graduate student, who was also an assistant of mine later on at the National Committee, who was doing her PhD on Ireland. Mm -hmm. And she would write for the American Foreign Policy newsletter in those days. Um, so I knew something was going on, but I didn't know too much. Um, and she briefed me on some of the details. And that led me to believe that I may have a hook on how to get the um, organization involved with the Northern Irish conflict. What was the hook? Britain was in great financial difficulties in those days, and Britain did pour in billions of dollars into Northern Ireland every year, with a population of a billion and a half, roughly speaking. Yeah. And I, I thought to myself, how long could Britain do this without it impacting Britain's allegiance to us, our closest ally? Because Britain was helping us with NATO, was helping us in the Middle East, was helping us in the Far East, etc. But Britain would no longer be able to do it if it continues to support Northern Ireland. So I presented this to Flynn. We presented it to the National Committee, including Andrew Bittleduk, who was at that time a member. And um, the Executive Committee said, yes, let us do it. So we moved ahead and we, in, uh, we invited Jerry Adams to come to the United States, among other players in Northern Ireland, including Paisley, uh, Robinson, uh, and others. Mm -hmm. um, John Hume, I think. John he, Hume, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yes, yeah. John Hume, Alderdice. Yeah. Um, and the State Department turned us down so far as Jerry Adams is concerned. We don't want to have anything to do with him. Um, so um, uh, what we did is, uh, Bill Flynn did this, organize uh, the Irish American community. Uh, and with the Irish, you know, we had friends, including, you know, of course, also uh, Soderbergh, Nancy Soderbergh, among others, uh, who helped us. And 
Clinton, President Clinton decided to overrule the State Department. And we got a 48 hour visa for Jerry, Jerry Adams mm -hmm. to come to the United States. Paisley refused to come. He didn't want to have anything to do with a terrorist, etc. Robinson didn't come, McCrea didn't come, but Jerry Adams, Hume, among others, did come. Um, and um, it was interesting at Idlewild the Airport in those days, um, there was a huge press conference, uh, which was anticipated. So Bill Flynn asked me to welcome him and I should be assisted by Sister Carol with all the arrangements, press people, et cetera, et cetera. So she came with me. Uh, to um, Idlewild, there was this enormous press conference. Um, and then we traveled to New York with Flynn's uh, uh, limousine and his security person, and of course, Sister Carol. And uh, I got into a discussion with him. I said, I said, Mr. Adams, you fought the British. I, as a sternist, fought the British from different aspects, etc. So you had a common bond from a the beginning. A common bond, and then we began to address each other by our first names, and we Fantastic. became good friends. Mm -hmm. So we came to Manhattan, and we uh, uh, put him up uh, because of the controversy. There were mass demonstrations in front of the Ward of Astoria, and the Ward of Astoria. And Carol arranged that we would uh, register him under the name of Shlomo Brezhnev. <laughs> Shlomo Brezhnev, a very well-known Israeli scholar. <laughs> well, and we do know, I mean, that gets to me, you know, the work of the National Committee that you did, because um, you were an integral part, led to what now is known as the Good Friday Agreement. So, Well, as actually, it was the Good Friday Agreement was a little bit before. No, in I think 1993, it, I believe it no, was. I think it was 98. But um, but anyway, you played an integral part. Oh, yes, part. yes, yeah. yes, yeah. yes. But, well, let me tell you, after our conference at the Board of Astoria, I brought Jerry back to the airport. Mm -hmm. And in the car driving to the airport, I said, well, Jerry, where do we go from here? He said, George, I promise you, we will not go back to the old ways. That's fantastic. Yeah. Now, uh, and following this, it was in August 1994, in August 1994, when the IRA declared a ceasefire, mm -hmm. removed the bullet from politics. This was followed by the loyalist ceasefire. It was in October, I'm pretty sure it was October 1994, and the loyalists even invited Flynn, the Catholic, to come to witness That's it. That's great. Yes, Very and good. Flynn flew over yeah. to Northern Ireland and to be present when the Orioles declared. Well, maybe fun. you want to tell us a little bit because I do want to leave some time for questions. But how did that lead to what has become one of our flagship programs, but the Forum on Asia Pacific Security? So how did we go from Northern Ireland to uh, mm. to Beijing? You cannot imagine the publicity we received. The National Committee received. So I was in due time approached by a Chinese official from the mission, a counselor. Here in New York. Yes, Guo Changlin. I still remember I was dealing with him a lot, Guo Changlin, who said, you know, um, we became friends. We met for dinner, lunch, etc." You did something very interesting and very positive for uh, Ireland, Northern Ireland. Do you think you, your committee could do something similar when it comes to the Taiwan mainland controversy? Mm -hmm. Sounds exciting to me. And we were talking about it. And uh, at a certain point, he said, um, we would invite a group of you to come to China fact-finding mission mm -hmm. to include also Taiwan. He had nothing to say about Taiwan, but he mentioned you know, it. What did I know about China? Very little. A colleague of mine at the Graduate Center was Don Zagoria, mm -hmm. who had already written for me for the newsletter in those days, the American Foreign Policy newsletter. Yeah. I had already written, I said, Don, 
look what's going on. Would you be interested in heading such a group at the National Committee? And he immediately said yes. And pretty much the rest is history. Yeah, well, yeah. it's uh, fantastic. It's kind of interesting, yeah, he, he that was, connection. Yeah, he was in the political science department and I was in the history department. So you knew each other before? Before, yes. Yeah, yeah you know. But he me. hadn't been involved in the National Committee before that? No, no. Other than no. writing for the newsletter? Yes, yeah. uh, a few articles that he wrote uh, on the newsletter, yes. Well, George, I just have to say that um, I'm honored to be sitting here with you because these things that you talk about that you were involved in in your life I think have been so important for US foreign policy and for conflict resolution you know, around the world. And yeah. I'm really glad that you have written your, um, your memoir and it's something we were talking about yesterday. Maybe you could talk about the importance and how you didn't want to write your memoir and why you decided to do it. May I mention something before sure. still? From the Chinese one, I was approached by Tokayev foreign minister of Kazakhstan. Mm -hmm. That's how we became involved with Kazakhstan. Um, I said, well, he better write something for the American foreign policy uh, newsletter to explain it, et cetera, et cetera. And when we decided that we'll go to Kazakhstan, I asked Don Rice to head a mission. Don's with us today. Yes, you're the guilty one, Don. <laughs> Don Rice, um, and then Michael Rifkin, who was a top expert in the field, fluent in Russia, has lived in the area, et cetera. And also Dick Howe and he's went with on us that today first too. trip. I couldn't go because I was going all the time to China, to Europe, et cetera, and I couldn't go again to Central Asia. So it was Don Rice who led the group. It was Dick Howe and uh, Michael Rifkin. So I just wanted to bring this in. Well, and I would say that that's how I first had, had direct knowledge of that program because I was a Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Central Asia. And I remember Grace Kinnan Warnicky came and talked to me about what you were doing. So, um, so it just shows one good deed leads um, to another. But anyway, I would just tell everyone, because you know we're probably getting a little short of time and I want people to be able to ask questions because there are many, many more details in the book. And um, if you would like to ask a question, if you want to just wave your hand at me or you know use the raise hand function, we can, uh, then you can unmute yourself and ask George a question uh, directly. Um, because I think that um, I've got plenty more questions, but I've read his book, so I know all his secrets. But perhaps you know some of you would like to you know ask some things that are uh, on your mind. So does anyone like to ask a question? May I say something more? Sure. Yeah. Go ahead. It's your yeah. program. Uh, for George. the for the Latvian contingent, I became very close friend with Vira Vicker Freiberga. We worked very hard on NATO, bringing Latvia into NATO, which through the National Committee, we have helped uh, do so. And uh, over the years, uh, we also, so far as the EU is concerned, um, and we became very close friends, a personal friend. She has often been to my house. Uh, I've hosted her uh, and I've often been, uh, to her, uh, to the castle in Riga and her summer residence in Yurmala, and uh, Imans and Carlis, uh, they're all dear and close friends. I just wanted to mention this to the Latvian contingent. Well, and your uh, yes, uh, connection to her continues because yes. she's, you know, the co chair of the Nizavi Ganjavi International Center, which is based in Baku. But she and a lot of her former um, counterparts from Europe and around the world are involved and they've gotten me involved. So the National Committee still, we do work with them on the Western Balkans. We've also had some preliminary discussions on other areas of the world, but your connection to her has opened up a way of us working with you know, um, another international organization. So, um, but Someone, I think someone wanted to ask a question or does anyone have a question they'd like to ask George? 
I just wanted to say uh, yes, Vida Beach Vapor is a wonderful person, and I'm very pleased that you have worked with her, and she has done uh, so much to to help Latvia bring her bring Latvia into NATO and and uh, international presence, and uh, we really appreciate your association with her. Thank you. I'm having lunch on uh, on Tuesday with Andres Pedagovic. Who is the? Uh, yes, I know. I know. Yeah. Very well. yeah, he's the perm rep, the Latvian perm rep to the UN. Yeah, I'm That's having lunch with him on Tuesday. Please, please give him, give him the best regards from the Zarish. Any other? Anyone else have any questions? I'm sure people must have some uh, questions that they'd like to ask George, either about the National Committee or other aspects of his early um, early life. I'd ask a question, it's Nancy. Oh, Nancy, great. Uh, first of all, George, that was so fantastic. And I can't wait, Where I have two questions. One, where can we get the book? And two, um, given your, I, I've always been fascinated by your Stern Gang activities and just on a, a personal level, um, what do you think the state of Israel um, is, how do you think it's faring now? and um, having fought yourself for it, where do you see it going? Well, um, we at the National Committee had a major program on the Middle East. Um, and uh, our conclusion was that the best solution for Israel and the neighboring countries and the Palestinians would be a two-state solution. And I have that also in the book and also uh, in the 40th anniversary uh, a booklet that we put out at the National Committee, a two-state solution. Um, and for as long as the Palestinians refuse to come to the table, Israel simply takes advantage of the situation and gradually keeps on expanding. Yeah. But the two-state solution, in my opinion, is still the long term. Um, uh, but do you think it's still within reach? I think so. Uh, but. Um, uh, the interesting thing is that one of the um, heads of the program was Ambassador Feridun Hoveda. Hoveda. I remember him. Yes, you remember him. Yes, um, he was um, the uh, Iranian um, rep here at the UN and of course was dethroned in 1979 as a revolution. And I got to know him and he was talking about and bringing people together, mainly Muslims, Arab Muslims, uh, not Iranian um, conferences. And they all came to the conclusion that no genuine peace can come between, genuine peace can come between Israel and the Arab world and the Arab world and the West for as long as there is no reformation of the mindset of the Muslims. According to Hoveda and all these many, many people from the Middle East, Muslims, uh, mostly who participated, uh, including Ragida Gerger, you may know. Um, she was a uh, regular participant. Um, uh, they all agree that the reforming of the mindset was critical before we can speak of, quote unquote, eternal peace in the Middle East and also between Arabs and Muslims. And I think because of what we have done, the publications, the conferences at the National Committee, we certainly contributed to the uh, Arab Spring. No question about it. Because we had to reprint our uh, booklets on the Middle East time and again, because they were, we would print 1,500 copies. We had to print another 1,500 copies all dealing with the issue of reform, role of women in the Middle East, uh, so on and so forth. What do you think about uh, the Abraham Accords? Do you think that's a good thing? Or... Absolutely, no question about it. Um, it's in the right direction. And even if you read in Saudi Arabia, women are beginning to drive, permitted to drive, etc. This is what we have urged with from way back in the 80s and 90s. And we have a lot of publications dealing with this subject. Yeah, so it's... Yeah, it's certainly, it's a wonderful beginning. It started with Jordan, 
Well, the interesting thing is when we gave the Hans Morgenthau Award to uh, His Majesty um, King Hussein, mm -hmm. he told me, uh, oh, we're quite friendly, uh, he told me, you know, the, what you read in the press, what's going on between Jordan and uh, Israel, you must not take it very seriously, what goes on behind the scenes. And at that time, there were very tense uh, moments between Jordan and Israel. But he said, behind the scenes, we work with Golda Meir. Oh, great. Yeah. Yeah. So behind the scenes. So don't take too seriously what you what read you in, hear the, in the press. What you yeah. read in the press. Yeah. Any other, anyone else have a question for George? There must be some uh, others who want well, to. I'm going to ask one question, which is a little bit off the beaten track here, but just listening to you, George, and obviously oh, the. Katie Holbrook. Oh. Pardon? Well, George wanted to know who was speaking. It's it's you, Hi, it's Edie. Edie Holbrook, who is a former member of our board of trustees and a very great supporter of the National Committee. Well, I've just been intrigued listening to all that you've been telling us. Of course, I've read your book as well, and uh, thinking in terms of the impact of, of uh, sort of people on the shaping of policy in kind of the real world, and what you, as a wise man at this point in time might think about the intrusion of uh, technology in terms of beginning to shape policy issues and uh, how the hell we're gonna be dealing with all of that. So far as technology is concerned, I am very, very much concerned about cyber, cyber warfare. And Edie, it was you who brought this to my attention. I knew about it but you were a driving force at the National Committee to organize, and of course I okayed it, it was a, okay of course of the Executive Committee for you to uh, lead a group. And I remember how we talked about it and we went to West Point and we were cooperating with West Point on the same issue. I cannot stress enough how important cyber, the cyber issue is. Remember what happened to Estonia yeah. And then, of course, in the in a computer in the State Department, in the Stuxnet, uh, all these things were, you know, uh, augured the future. Right. Yeah. And look what's happening now. I mean, it's, uh, it is a critical, critical problem. And I think, uh, if I may say so, uh, I think the National Committee has to do something more about it, uh, what ED really started. We actually have a program coming up that no one knows about because we haven't announced it, but it's actually someone who works for the US government who's gonna talk about what's going on in the cyber realm. Um, more to follow, uh, it, it's coming up shortly. Um, but anyway, uh, I think you're absolutely right that um, these kind of what I'll call transnational issues Cyber being one of them. But China. Means, but China's. It's, in, not the, it's not technology. Yeah. Well, but China's uh, tangentially involved yeah. in yeah. China, oh, yes, China course, and yes. Russia. And Russia. And, Absolutely. You know, but things like climate change, things like artificial intelligence, things. N nuclear that, proliferation. Nuclear proliferation, or even the pandemic. I mean, one of the things that is so exciting to me is that George and I have been vaccinated, and so we're able to be together in the same room. And um, if you haven't been vaccinated, I urge you, you know, to do so. Um, but really, those are the kind of threats, I'll call them non-traditional transnational threats that, um, that we really need to have policies mm -hmm. on. So I would agree, this is um, the, you know, the future of organizations like the National Committee. The core, mm -hmm. agreed. Any, anyone else have some um, questions? Because I think we're just about out of time. So first, I'd like to thank you, George, not just to thank you for today, but to thank you for all you've done, again, not just for the National Committee, but, you know, for our country, for Israel, you know, for the world. And I will say, in discussions that we've had, I can imagine it must have been very difficult to write about these things that happened to you. But if you don't write them, the next generations may never know the atrocities of the, the former generations. So thank you very much for doing that. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to address people who are interested 
friends and potential friends who become now actual friends. Um, I'm delighted to have been with you. Thank you very much. And you can buy his book again on Amazon. And I will tell you, I mean, I read it over the weekend. Very easy to read. You'll be, like I said, when I saw about the Stern gang, because I can't imagine George being uh, a terrorist or planning assassination attempts. So you'll laugh yeah. out loud on that. And then I wanted him to tell the Sister Carol story. We're recording this so that she can listen to the program. But, you know, to me, that was a turning point because mm -hmm. all nonprofits need to have financial support. So and we've well had done. it ever since. Well done. We still have a very strong relationship and are very pleased with our longtime relationship Mutual. with Mutual of America. Absolutely, yeah. yes. So, um, and thanks to all of you, because many of the people on this program today have also been not only members of our board of trustees, but very strong uh, supporters, both with your time and your financial resources. So we couldn't do it without all of you, but George, thank you. Thank you thank for you. your service to your country. Thank you. I'm always prepared to help, however. We're going to, I'm going to take you up on that. As I said, is that, um, his, when his grandson came to help me, I said, I want to introduce myself. I'm the new George Schwab. I've got big shoes to fill, but thank you, George. Yeah, you're doing a fantastic job. Well, thanks. And thanks to everybody for participating in today's program.